Thomas J. Rowinski. He's a botanist with the USDA Forest Service. Tom has been a professional ecologist, botanist for 33 years. He works throughout New England and New York on invasive plant and deer overabundance issues. His presentation will explore the deer overabundance issue and its many challenges. His talk title is Deer, Forest, and People, Understanding and Managing Socio-Ecological Systems. I used to study vegetation. Now we study socio-ecological systems, the interaction of people and nature. Bottom line, you know, segments of society enjoy benefits of deer plenty. Other segments are left to pay the associated costs. So what's my take home message? It's the same as Jim's. The so-called deer problem is mainly a people problem. We've allowed this to happen. And in my mind, it's the greatest forest conservation challenge of our time. Okay, so a brief outline. We're gonna talk about, we're gonna see wisdom from the greats. I'll talk a little bit about white-tailed deer because we all love them and they're fascinating. I'll talk about forests. I'll show slides from different forests that I've visited. Talk about us and then something about finding balance. So Rachel Carson, you know, great conservationist, wrote Silent Spring. She talks here about nature having all these checks and balances and we've upset that balance. I think she'd be dismayed today to know that we're in the midst of another silent spring. These forests no longer contain the kind of bird life they once did. If ever I write a book, it's gonna be called Scentless Spring. As a direct analogy to what Rachel was concerned about because there are no more flowers in these woods. You can't go and smell and appreciate the wonder of, of nature and all its dimensions. So we're in the midst of a scentless spring across very large areas. You know how big Pennsylvania is? You know how many millions of acres that is? New York State, the Nature Conservancy did a study using Forest Service data, and, and they identified about 30% of the forest lacked sufficient regeneration, which you wouldn't necessarily all be attributed to deer, but deer were a major factor there. Aldo Leopold, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. You can call yourself a conservationist if your lands are healthy and productive, if you have Canada lily and the butterflies it supports. If your lands are not healthy, you've got work to do. This is a chart that could be repeated in many parts of the country. This is from Connecticut. The graph shows the amount of cleared farmland going down, the amount of forest land going up, and right when the state assumed management responsibility for the deer, and when Lyme disease was first detected, it shot right up. So deer directly affect the growth, reproduction, survival of plants by eating the flowers, fruits, etc. And deer will also eat bark, and they will dig in the ground for Indian cucumber root tubers, I learned. They love fruits and acorns. Japanese Barberry is not preferred, trilliums are. You know, I do quite a bit of monitoring for cooperators where we set out re sort of monitoring plots. And one thing we looked at was white trillium out in Cayuga County, because we know it's a preferred plant. So I set up 10 100 square meter plots, and we counted all the flowering trilliums the first year. In subsequent years, we measured them twice a week apart, basically. And look how much the numbers drop, from eight to three, from 14 to seven. It's one thing to say, well, we shot 40 deer here. What does that mean? You wanna see, equate that with some improvement in the, in the habitat. Deer love this, this is like deer candy. In Pennsylvania, I don't know if there's a single place where hobblebush produces flowers. I've been told that it's been wiped out from huge areas. We also monitor them in the spring and then in the summer. So when you measure the heights in the spring, they're pretty low, but each summer they grow a little bit taller. The next spring they get browsed back. They grow a little bit in the summer, they get browsed back. So there's no net gain here. They just keep getting hammered down. American beech, it's not really preferred. When the deer herd remains the same or increases, they stay short. So deer damaged forests are, are disintegrating. They have little ability to withstand disturbance and absorb change. Those two words go into the definition of forest resilience. 
Also lost is what's called biotic resistance to invasive plant invasion. You can see on the right of the fence there's poison ivy and there's oaks and there's pines. On the left you might make out there's just a little bit of Japanese stiltgrass. And the forester said, oh, we've, we just found the state's biggest population of Japanese stiltgrass, which was just working its way into Rhode Island. It was in a disturbed log landing. He said, what should we do? Call the Boy Scouts? Pull it? Should we spray it? And I said, Rob, build a four-acre fence around it, and just trust me, please. And by God, they did it, and in three years, the stilt grass was basically gone. Why? Because we leveled the playing field. The native plants now had a competitive ability, and they've pretty much totally wiped out the stilt grass here. So on a landscape level scale, if you're trying to control invasive plants, you gotta get away from you know, the Boy Scouts pulling the weeds or spraying them. Think of what it would take to restore this whole landscape. And that, of course, is leveling the playing field, trying to restore biotic resistance. Deer damaged forests sometimes develop what's called a recalcitrant understory. A hay scented fern is the real bad one. It's native, but the deer don't eat it, although I have seen evidence that they do. Okay, so now let's talk about you all, people. Here's a representative of that fancy word I've been throwing out, socio-ecological system. It's pretty basic. We have animals, we have plants, we have people, and they all interact in certain ways. Wildlife eat plants, foresters manage, uh, manage forests, wildlife biologists work with people and wildlife, but very few people operated right here, and that's where we have to be. And in studying different socio-ecological systems, the deer are always the same. So that's pretty much the constant. And the vegetation also can be quite similar. The real wild card are the people. So the people in one community may have totally different attitudes about managing deer than in other parts of the world. So white-tailed deer overabundance is various definitions. We want the positive values of deer to be way up here and the negatives down here. But what we're seeing is at some point, People start hating deer, they have town meetings, and all of a sudden you're stuck in this situation where the negatives by consensus at town meetings outweigh the positives. So also in Tom Rooney's paper, there's six things you wanna look at to judge if you have too many deer. Are they destroying the forest? This 80 acres will never be forest again in Rhode Island. Number two, the, are the deer themselves in poor condition? Uh, this is from North Brantford, Connecticut on a reservoir property, over 100 deer per square mile. The deer are scrawny and pathetic and, and tough to look at. Number three and four, it's related to ticks and whether they're being transmitted to humans. I talked about Brookhaven Lab where the poor fawns become blinded by the ticks and die. Number five, the whole realm of potential economic impacts, be it to your shrubbery, to the car repair, deductible that you have to pay, et cetera. Maybe for your medical bills also, the deductible for that. And finally, an increased risk of injury or harm to humans. This occurred in Lincoln, Rhode Island a few years ago. An eyewitness said, I looked up at the passenger and she's covered with blood. Then I looked in the back seat and you can see the deer and the deer was still alive, it was still kicking. So you know, one bright spot is, there wasn't a term for this, eco-environmental gentrification. No, no, we can't cut our trees down. Same thing about hunting and deer. So we tried to gentrify our natural lands. We worked hard to protect them, and the first thing we had to do was get rid of the unsavory characters, like hunting, because hunters posed a threat to the animals, bullets and arrows, and they posed a threat to us, bullets and arrows. Well, the unintended consequence is that it just totally backfired, and people are realizing this. Is wildlife any better? No, biodiversity is suffering, homogenization. Deer in large numbers are still getting killed by cars, and people are being injured in car wrecks and by Lyme disease instead of by arrows and bullets. So it's a failed model, and you still see it. Okay, so <laughs> the other thing, and this is, this is a real concept in the social sciences called a wicked problem. One aspect of a wicked problem is that if you're successful in solving one part of it, it creates a whole new problem elsewhere. So for example, if we reduce the deer herd down and the trees grew, some people are happy, well guess what? All of a sudden the hunters no longer buy licenses, mount a protest, and 
it's just a mess. And, and the big factors involved there are willful blindness, organizational silence, and, and the fact that we are by nature a species in denial. Finally, a couple of quotes. You know, quite often a nature preserve will say, we manage for forest products, wildlife, biodiversity, and recreation. Well, look what Stephen Horsley wrote. Doesn't matter what values you're trying to maximize deer, are negatively affecting all of them. And Jim, you know, I've referred to you a lot. You know, I love you. I wonder if you would help me finish my program by stepping up here. Uh, helping modern Americans understand and accept the need for human oversight isn't an easy task. It involves reconnecting people to their ecosystems again, getting Americans outdoors and re-engaged with the land and the natural world in ways that, to put it bluntly, get dirt under their fingernails, blood on their hands, and even a wood splinter or two in their kneecaps or butts. 